and we are rolling. Tell us about the Hawaii dementia prevention trial you did. What did you learn? Were you able to slow, stop, or reverse dementia? How did you do it? Well, it's a big job doing a clinical trial, randomized clinical trial, with all of the effort involved. We had a huge team, and we, I designed the protocol, and then the team helped carry it all out. And this lady is Catherine Blake. She's the president of the Neuroscience Nutrition Foundation. She also worked with me in the trial and is one of the authors on the paper. And she's a nutrition educator where we now work at the Maui Memory Clinic. We, and I'm his wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not forget in that case. part. <laughs> so the trial, I'd like to answer a little bit. Some of the things we learned, it was very exciting. Um, Steve put in, a, was it 16 nutritional inter targeted nutritional interventions to help delay dementia? We were working with mild cognitive impairment. And trying to get it to the point before it got to dementia. Well, many things were learned, but I think that one thing we learned was that even using 16 proven ways of dealing with, you know, diminishing dementia from progressing, it's a challenge to have people comply with that many changes. So maybe 16 was a bit far reaching, but we wanted to do as much as we could uh, My goal for the was people to make sure that with all of these interventions, we could really get some results. And then later down the road, we can find out which of the 16 interventions were more powerful, which maybe aren't even necessary. But having all of those, our goal was to take people with mild cognitive impairment, kind of the precursor to dementia, and stop them from moving into dementia. But as it worked out, it took enough time to enroll people that the average was just into dementia when we started. But within three months, they were out of that through mild cognitive impairment and in the normal range of testing. And that persisted and got better until at nine months, they were nearly normal on our testing scale. So instead of just slowing the progression of dementia, we actually wound up reversing it. And we attribute most of this to reversing vascular dementia rather than the amyloid plaques of Alzheimer's disease which we'll talk about more as we go on. Please explain in more detail the results after nine months of the mini mental state exam scores that went from borderline dementia to normal in nine months. Well, the way it happened, we used a mini mental state exam as our key. We did have more elaborate testing, but we used that as our key for the test. And the way it works is if you're 25 to 30, that's considered normal range. Between 20 and 25, that's considered mild cognitive impairment, kind of the precursor to dementia. People with mild cognitive impairment, they tend to progress to dementia maybe 10% per year. So we wanted to stop that progression. By the time we started, dementia cutoff is about 20. So our average starting was 19. But within just three months, we'd already gone over 25. And by nine months, we were an average of 29 out of 30. So people did seem to get cognitively well within that time period. So that's how it worked. Are there any supplements that studies have shown protect against Alzheimer's? Catherine, you want to outline some of those? Oh, yes. Uh, folate has been proven to be four times more effective in diminishing Alzheimer's uh, in patients who use it. The, Mind Rush and Aging Project by Martha Claire, Claire Morris, which was published in 2018, had a benefit of 11 years of rejuvenative intellectual activity by eating only one or two servings of green leafy vegetables a day. Now, what appalls me is that who is who can you find who's not eating that many? But for those who did eat one or two servings, of green leafy vegetables per day, their memory was 11 years younger. And you mentioned folate, and folate works together with another B vitamin, vitamin B12. And these two work together to create this wonderful substance called SAM-E, or S-adenosylmethionine, for long. I'll call it SAM-E. SAM-E is able to quench, to methylate, to quiet the genes that make the plaques, the Alzheimer's plaques. So this is why the folate and the vitamin B12 are so effective, 
And we used these two as part of our interventions in the trial. Can diet delay or reverse dementia? Tell us about the Rush Aging and Memory Project that delayed dementia by 11 years. Well, I did speak about that a little bit, and it's just so exciting when we find a trial like this, which is examining these features. And the folate that is high in the green leafy vegetables is part of the benefit that helped delay the aging by 11 years. And of course, the other benefits of green leafy vegetables are those carotenoids. You can't see the beautiful colors when they're masked by the green chlorophyll, but they're there. And this was actually published in the most prestigious journal Neurology in 2018. Are there pharmaceutical drugs that reverse or stop dementia? I wish there were. Uh, there are two drugs used by neurologists for Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and sometimes they use them for mild cognitive impairment, kind of off-label. Uh, Donepezil is by far the most common drug used. And it has, according to a recent study in a gerontology journal, little effect on the treatment. And this study looked at also the side effects, which were an increased 76% of vomiting and 62% of diarrhea with this particular drug. So it does tend to help some people for a short while, but I think the key thing to remember is that it does not slow or stop neurodegeneration. It doesn't slow or stop the disease. It hides the symptoms for a little while while neurodegeneration continues. The other drug is memantine, and it has even a smaller effect on memory or cognition. And some of the side effects like heart failure are just heartbreaking. I would like to add that the side effects of donepezil of vomiting and diarrhea are a little bit dose dependent. And what we saw in the clinic was that if people were taking five milligrams of the drug, they had very little side effects. But and very little effects They had too. little effects. So the people who were taking larger doses uh, were having more stimulation, but more discomfort as well. You say the principal cause of brain cell death is oxidation. How do we prevent oxidation? It's kind of a two-pronged effect. We would like to get more antioxidants into the brain, easy to do, and we would like to not eat a lot of things that create more oxidation and more inflammation, which also increases oxidation, because oxidation damages the delicate cell membranes of brain cells, which after all have many of these polyunsaturated fatty acids, the long chain one with lots of opportunities for damage. Some of the antioxidants that we used in the study were from food, some were from supplement, and some were minerals to support our own inside endogenous antioxidant systems. What foods or nutrients are ideal for memory? Well, I'd like to. Okay. One thing that we're looking at is foods that are high in the antioxidants. What we want is vitamins A, C, E, selenium, zinc, uh, comfer, manganese, and uh, the latter minerals help us create our own antioxidants. And those are found in uh, fruits and vegetables and whole grains nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. and beans. So if you're getting a whole plant diet, you're really addressing a lot of those antioxidant needs. Now you're not going to be getting those antioxidants if you're eating a lot of red meat or even chicken or... Any animal a, product, any basically. Fish. It's gonna be extremely low in antioxidants, but also high in inflammatory substances that create more oxidation. And one example is endotoxins, and so when you have an animal that died, it has bacteria. We all know this, it has to be cooked. The bacteria is killed. But the leftover shells of the bacteria, coupled with the excess saturated fat, tend to get into our bloodstream. And when they do, our immune systems recognize this as a bacterial infection. And so increase inflammation in the bloodstream, which is also translated into the brain, for a period of hours after a meal that includes these animal products, and this is a way to kill off brain cells rather than to protect them. You just mentioned um, foods that are bad for our brains and our memory and, and, and might contribute to dementia. Are there any others that we should know about? A saturated fats are something we really want to consider. The American Heart Association recommends uh, 
Now it's 5% of our daily calories as saturated fats, which if you're eating a normal 2,000 calorie day, amounts to about 11 grams. So if you start looking at the saturated fat amounts in foods, you'd be amazed at how quickly it adds up. Uh, half a can of Spam, I don't usually eat Spam and it's been a long time, but in Hawaii where we live, it's one of the five major food groups, <laughs> Spam, everything. Uh, a half a can is 18 grams of saturated fat. Tell now, them about coconut oil. I, I, <laughs> give me a minute, honey. <laughs> um, so the, we've met people in the clinic who eat two cans of Spam at breakfast. Oh, mercy. So they're getting way, you know, 36, 72 grams of saturated fat at breakfast, and they're only supposed to have 11 per day. Some of the other numbers are uh, uh, butter's only four grams. Well, three pats of butter adds up to eight grams of saturated fat, so you're already almost at your limit with butter. So don't eat anything else that day, right? Hardly. Uh, I'm going to let you do the coconut oil. The um, plant-based foods of beans, nuts, seeds, uh, vegetables, and fresh fruits are very low in saturated fats for the most part, and you can eat all you want without suffering. Now the well, problem is- They are low, but on the other hand, when we look at a plant-based diet, you already are automatically getting a little bit here and there to the point where you're getting 4% of your calories every day, and you don't want to go over six. So you really, there isn't any room for animal fat in the diet or coconut oil, which Two tablespoons is 24 grams of saturated fat. Remember, 11 is your maximum for a day. And yes, they are the same saturated fats. There are three that clog arteries, myristic, lauric, and palmitic acids. And those three are well known to clog arteries. And of coconut oil, they make up 65% of coconut oil. You can see that coconut oil is really a hazard. And the correct term actually would be coconut fat since it's solid at room temperature. But marketing coconut fat is a lot tougher than marketing coconut oil. Well, it's tricky because it's gotten so popular right now, even among people who have plant-based diets. They love to use coconut fat for everything. They make chocolates at home with it and stir fry, but it is adding up and overloading their saturated fat. That's the one in the animal. And then the saturated in the fat plant kingdom, that's that high. goes into your body, increases cholesterol in the body. And also, when you're not getting any antioxidants, which coconut oil does not have antioxidants, a lot of other oils and oily foods like nuts and seeds do have antioxidants. The coconut oil is one of the few that doesn't have any vitamin E to speak of. When the saturated fat gets into your arteries, it increases cholesterol and arterial plaque. Arterial plaque is a huge problem with thinking ability in the brain. The carotid artery in the neck gets clogged up. You've probably heard of relatives who've had 60, 70, 80% clogging of their carotid arteries. And this has been shown to reduce blood flow to the entire brain, lowering our memory, lowering our ability to think, and actually killing off brain cells. Because the progress of vascular dementia is from tiny strokes, where a little bit of this plaque will break off, it'll stick in an artery, arterial, or capillary of the brain, and kill that branch of the brain eating up a little memory, eating up the ability to navigate, eating up the ability to even care for ourselves. So over time, vascular dementia eats the brain. However, if we keep our saturated fat low, then we can stop this process and even reverse it. It's been well shown that by keeping your saturated fats down to under 6% of calories, that you really can, that's under 11 grams per day, you really can reverse atherosclerotic plaque and open up the arteries and help your thinking. In one study, the doctors used a stent in the neck to open up just the carotid artery, okay? They're doing three inches of 24,000 miles of our <laughs> circulatory system, and yet they got a 7% boost on memory and thinking just from that, just getting a little more blood to the brain. So this is crucial. Outside of food and nutrients, what should people do about memory loss? Well, the physical exercise, of course, does boost circulation into the brain, and that's really good. You want to tell them about brain games? Oh, yes. We're working with a neuropsychologist, Dr. Thomas Harding, at the Maui Memory Clinic, and he is an expert on brain games. What he does is a, an exhaustive analysis of where the memory is not working. 
all the different parts of the brain, he tests exhaustively. And he finds whether it's uh, directional or people's names or daily functions, he figures out exactly which parts of the brain are not up to par. And then he has created a series of brain games to target each one for strengthening that area. And he knows from what he speaks because he went through total memory loss and regained it all for himself. And outside of these targeted brain games, if we can keep learning, then we keep our brain sharp. Learn a language, learn a skill, keep learning and keep interacting with people, and this keeps our brains healthy. It's not nutrition, but it's very effective. You've mentioned some things to prevent vascular dementia. Anything else you want to mention about preventing vascular dementia? Well, one of these topics on vascular dementia is inflammation. It is an inflammatory disease. So we want to eat as many plant anti-inflammatories as possible. They're found a lot in the cruciferous family, like kale and cabbage and Brussels sprouts, and that whole family is really rich in anti-inflammatories called indole-3-carbonyl or sulforaphane. Then we have the soy products, please only organic soy products, and these soy products contain genistein and diazdein, and these two are anti-inflammatory components that have been shown to reduce the inflammation in the arteries, in the brain, and even in the joints for osteoarthritis. And on the other hand, of course, we want to avoid the inflammatory substances that may occur in, for instance, broiled or barbecued meat has these substances called advanced glycation end products. And they encourage inflammation in our arteries and in our brains and basically shower the brain with free radical radiation like damage. The advanced glycation end products are formed when the meat is broiled or barbecued and it has that brown crust on the outside. Or heavily fried. Or heavily fried. Now chefs are taught to do this deliberately, the Amadori reaction, the Maillard reaction, because it's considered to taste more delicious in the restaurants. But it is damaging in the long run because the word end products is the tricky word here. And it cannot be broken down by the body. You can't get rid of it. And then it, it can increase free radical activity 50 times in the brain. So it's actually cooking in the brain, trying to break it down. They're also found in aged cheeses. And in our trial, we had people not eat aged cheeses. Compliance was an issue, of course. But if you don't eat the aged cheeses, then you don't get the advanced glycation product in products there, too. Is there any way to lower the accumulation of amyloid plaques in the brain for people with Alzheimer's? Are there drugs that do that? How about more natural methods? There are not drugs that have successfully done that. There have been some trials, but they have failed. The thing is, those, end pro those, those fuzz balls called amyloid plaque in the brain are very difficult to get rid of. The only substance that has been found to actually reduce them is a plant called Gota Cola, which we did use in our trial. But I imagine the effect is very small. However, as these amyloid plaques are being made, the genes create these two enzymes, gamma secretase and beta secretase, and they snip off the amyloid precursor protein into these beta amyloid peptides. They then become toxic, neurotoxic, damaging the brain, these newly formed amyloid betas, and they become fibrils and then become part of the amyloid plaque. So if we can stop the process of making amyloid beta, which we can by quenching the genes that do this, including the genes that increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease, we can quench them all. As long as you're getting your vitamin B12 and folate, two harmless and safe B vitamins, we also added SAMe to the trial because that way we were sure that people were quenching the genes and quieting them so they weren't building these toxic neurotoxic compounds that become amyloid plaque. And again, by reducing the advanced glycation end products that would lodge in the plaque, showering the brain with free radicals, that helps too. So while we can't completely stop the plaque or get rid of the plaque, we can stop the neurotoxicity and a lot of the damage to the brain while they're being formed and after they're formed from compounds being lodged in them. So you're telling us that the APOE4 presenilin gene can be suppressed. You can quench the expression of the gene. Well, those with are two different factors. genes, but okay. yes, the presenilin gene you. 
uh, definitely can be suppressed with these two simple, cheap, safe B vitamins. And for safety, I went two different ways in the trial, the two B vitamins and the SAMe that they make. So we wanted to be really sure that people were not building these neurotoxic products anymore and building their amyloid plaques anymore. And SAMe does have, it's very safe. We produce it ourselves. However, if you're taking neuroactive, excuse me, psychoactive medication, uh, such as serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you should not mix the two. SAMe has also been used for depression. And since it makes you happy and the psychoactive drugs make you happy, you don't want to get too happy. You said higher saturated fats result in more cholesterol in the blood and that directly causes more amyloid plaques to form. So by lowering the saturated fat, we reduce the amyloid plaques forming. Anything else you want to expand on in more detail on, on yes, what Yes, this is a is? different topic than I, we were just talking about. We are talking about raising cholesterol and plaque in the arteries that contributed to microstrokes and larger strokes and heart attacks, but this is something different. When your cholesterol is high, you're also building more of these beta secretase and gamma secretase enzymes that actually form the amyloid plaque in the brain, the senile plaques, the Alzheimer's plaques. So by keeping your cholesterol low, you also are lowering the production of these plaques. So you see we're working on different ways, natural, safe ways, and the side effect of lowering saturated fat and cholesterol in the blood, of course, are less risk of heart attack, strokes, diabetes, and many other problems. Please tell us more about the studies you've used that showed ginkgo biloba improved co cognition and helped in delaying the onset of Alzheimer's. Well, I'll answer this one. Uh, there was a recent study, 2019, and it was an expert consensus panel all over the world. And they got together and they studied the standardized extract of ginkgo biloba, which is what we used in the trial. The one they studied is identical to the one we used in the trial. And they found that this ginkgo biloba standardized extract was the only thing that helped with both vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia and was the only thing that helped with the activities of daily living in those with moderate or advanced Alzheimer's disease who were having problems with this. So this was a very good study that confirmed once and for all that there are some very good effects from this. Now, I do want to mention a possible drug interaction with ginkgo biloba. It does tend to thin your blood. And by thinning your blood, it gets the blood to go into the arterioles and capillaries in the brain and penetrate so that you do think better. It's, it's used all over the world for students who want to do better on exams, for people who want to think clearly. However, since it does thin your blood a little bit, it should not be used with existing blood thinners, whether it's warfarin, Coumadin, or Pradaxa, Xeralto, Eliquis, any of the blood thinners should not be used concurrently with it. However, in our study, we did uh, confirm that the 81 milligrams of aspirin did not conflict with taking the Gotacola, and we passed that through the University Internal Review Board as being a safe combination. You said that the gold standard for medical studies is the double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial, and that nine of these gold-plated studies showed that ginkgo biloba delayed and treated Alzheimer's disease. How many doctors in America prescribe ginkgo biloba for dementia? Why don't doctors know about this or prescribe this? Would people do better if they combine ginkgo with pharmaceutical drugs made for dementia? Well, I think the answer is pretty clear that doctors in America do not prescribe uh, any kind of medical plants. However, in Europe, they do. Medical doctors prescribe medical plants in Europe. Most other countries. Most other countries, China, India, Many of the advanced countries in the world do use plants because, in general, they can be said to be a little safer than drugs. However, they are less profitable. So I think that some of the reasons that doctors don't use ginkgo biloba is they're not trained in medical plants in school. They are not constantly told about them by drug reps, which they are, of course, by, about all the drugs. And I think that doctors rightly say that Herbal medicine is unreliable because you don't know what's in the capsule. Maybe it's the plant you want, maybe it's not. That's why we use standardized extracts. Because for instance, with ginkgo, the ginkgo flavone glycosides are guaranteed to be 24%. The terpene lactones have to be 6%.
and the undesirable ginkolic acid has to be under 1% of these so that you know exactly what you're getting in every single one. And I think that if American medical doctors studied this more carefully, looked at the randomized controlled trials, that they would be convinced that this would be helpful, and yet they still would not be able to prescribe it because it's not FDA approved in America to use for this condition. And they could be sued for malpractice or something. When donopezil is used for memory concurrently with ginkgo biloba, they're finding that there's an 11% improvement in memory and thinking. When donopezil is used without gotocola, there's a slow decline. So the two can be used together, and it would be nice if American neurologists would learn about this and perhaps use them together for those not on blood thinners, of course. Can GOTO-COLA really help with Alzheimer's? It's a lovely plant. It's been used for centuries. We grow it. Yeah, it actually grows on our farm. And it's uh, been used for centuries in East India. The plant seems to be very safe with no safety concerns or drug interactions. I do only use safe solutions. It has been shown to improve the thinking, especially of older adults without dementia. And so this would be something that people can consider before they're starting to get memory loss. Also, it's used for those with Alzheimer's disease. It's neuroprotective, it's antioxidant, and the side effects are not adverse, they're good. A little lower blood pressure, a little better appetite, better sleeping. So it seems like a safe, natural way to combat age-related decline in thinking and memory. And the nervous system calms down a little from it too also. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, SAMe, uh, the scientific word that it stands for, uh, and, and does it decrease uh, amyloid beta production, thus preventing Alzheimer's disease? Are there studies supporting this? There certainly are studies recording this, and very recent ones, and uh, older ones too. S-adenosylmethionine is the long way to say it. It's term SAMe in the popular literature, and if you went to a store to buy it, it would be called SAMe. S-A-M small e. However, in the technical medical literature, it's just S-A-M. It's the abbreviation for it if you read a study. It does indeed methylate or quench the production of beta and gamma secretase enzymes, thus quenching the production of amyloid plaque in the human body. And one study then said, quote, thus preventing Alzheimer's disease, end quote. I believe a proper quote would be thus preventing the buildup of Alzheimer's plaques. Should people be taking SAMe? Is it natural or a drug? Because of the usefulness of it, I think it would be good to take it. Now, we can produce our own SAMe in the body with uh, the vitamin B12 and the folate. That will prevent the production of homocysteine, which is an undesirable blood product, and that homocysteine prevents the production of SAMe. So what we want to do is produce, produce it in our own bodies. And for that, vitamin B12 and folate are helpful in producing the SAMe. Now, SAMe is pretty interesting stuff because it has been used for knee osteoarthritis, and it was found to be as effective for the pain of knee osteoarthritis as Celebrex, a very powerful painkiller. But it didn't just hide the pain, it helped to keep the cartilage healthy. And as I mentioned, it's used for, as an antidepressant, so you can't use it with other psychoactive medications. Now, people may need to take vitamin B12 supplementary to produce their own SAMe in the body. Absolutely. Good and point. even uh, plant-based food eaters do not get vitamin B12 in their diet. And a lot of meat eaters have problems producing their own B12, so even they could benefit from taking extra B12. Well, they, they get it from the food, but they can't absorb it because the intrinsic factor is often blocked from the same cells that make stomach acid, the parietal cells. What do you both eat for lunch and dinner every day? <laughs> I think I'll take this one. <laughs> that, you can take that one. I'm the, uh, She's the cook. I'm the cook and the food and nutrition educator around here. Lunch, we've evolved. For a while it was brown rice and vegetables. And now it's more vegetables. We'll mix a variety of different vegetables. I'll steam or saute them with a little water and maybe some 
uh, tamari soy sauce and covered. They make their own juices that way. And then we'll have that perhaps with, um, I love a sesame tahini dressing that I make, which is sesame butter with umeboshi plum vinegar and garlic. Steve prefers it when I make it with lemon juice instead. So we'll have the vegetables with that on top. And really, that is very filling. If I use mushrooms, it a, adds a deep note. If we really need a deep note, which sometimes maybe once a week or off and on, I'll have beans, fresh beans, and we'll have them with our lunch. And that gives the long, deep satisfaction for longer through the day. On occasion, I'll make them I'll make a massaged kale salad and put in some nuts and seeds. Tell them about your creamy walnut dressing. Because in our trial, we wanted people to get the gamma tocopherol form of vitamin E, which is found in the hippocampus center of the brain as a neuroprotective uh, protection of the memory area of the brain, one of the memory areas, the hippocampus. That's the gamma tocopherol form of vitamin E, and that's found in walnuts and pecans, mostly. I also want to um, include the alpha-linolenic acid, which is the omega-3 anti-inflammatory. Uh, and that's rich in walnuts, too. And that's in rich in walnuts, too. So I made a creamy walnut dressing, which is really popular around our house. And that includes, uh, well, the trick is that there are two different flavors of vinegar in it. Who knew that? But a little bit of apple cider vinegar, the walnuts, garlic, Never leave the home without garlic, right? And then um, a little balsamic vinegar uh, along with a nutritional yeast. And um, sometimes you put flax powder in there too. And flax to powder thicken to thicken the sauce and give yeah. us a little more of Even the more omega 3s. Omega yeah. Alpha linolenic acid. So that creamy walnut dressing, when I make that, we know we're getting really a lot of neuroprotection and it's delicious too. And if I put that on the massaged kale salad, it all we gets can eaten. eat a lot of salad <laughs> and it's so satisfying and it's amazing lunch. Okay, on to dinner. Occasionally we'll have um, a nut-based a nut dressing. I have one that I really like in my cookbook, Dementia Prevention Cookbook. Or a sesame gavazio topping. Those are good yeah. too. I like the five minutes sauce, which is you take an onion and fry it for a while, uh, kind of little bit dry fry and then add peanut butter and water and it melts together and oh my gosh it's so good you wouldn't believe how good it is maybe a little salt and pepper it's so easy onions and peanut butter there you go a topping for anything you want to put it on and you're really in a good shape there so and the vitamin E is precious in those peanuts and peanuts peanut are butter. 22 milligrams of protein in 100 grams so they're you really feel like you're being fed a lot of nice protein and among there. nuts they're the highest in folate aren't they yes Yes. So we'll, and niacin. Yeah. So we'll have a little nut butter there, some onions, and again, vegetables. Uh, sometimes I'll cook grains. Now, I've been exploring the different grains for years. I go through the alphabet. Amaranth, buckwheat. I like the amaranth. It's really satisfying. We've tasty, really been kind of enjoying it. It's nutty and sweet, and it's just wonderful. And then, of course, quinoa, bar, uh, buckwheat, barley. I'm not afraid of gluten. I haven't had problems with it, so I consider it a strong, healthy grain. Can I talk about breakfast? Yes, please. We often have oats for breakfast, and we'll take either uh, rolled oats or oat groats that are already cut a little bit, and we'll soak them overnight instead of cooking them. And that makes them a lot sweeter. And then in the morning, we'll add fruit to it. Now, believe it or not, we live on an avocado farm, and we put avocados in our oats. It sounds funny, but it tastes delicious, and it's creamy and satisfying. We also put all kinds of fruit on our oats. It's sometimes it's hard to find the oats underneath a mountain of fruit. And a lot of it we grow ourselves, like fresh papayas. You can also surprise yourself by having oats with cabbage. Uh, there are all kinds of things you can do have as your morning breakfast. Now, we used to be somewhat purists and only eat the whole plant foods, but occasionally, since especially we've been working with a clinic and we work with people who shop uh, at regular grocery stores and they do not know what we're talking about, with tamari soy sauce or various things, we have been experimenting with what I'll call transition foods and meat analogs. And some of them are excellent. Gardein brand makes some great uh, fishless fillets and chickens, fried chickens and things. So once every now and then we have a good time and we get some of those meat analogs and we 
we have to test them out for you know to tell people what they're to try. They're not quite right? as healthy as as whole food, of course, but they're a lot healthier than the actual chicken, you know, to eat the the unchicken. And we found brands over time that people in the clinic we've said, okay, try this and tell us next month how you like it. And so over time, we've learned the different brands and flavors that people really like. And so you can do that at home too. You can try them out and see they have sausages, they have uh, hickory smoked uh, bologna slices Tofurky, that are Tofurky brand. Farms. Morningstar Farms makes all kinds of things that are, are meat analogs. And a lot of people who've had heart attacks or stroke are eating this to reduce their saturated fat. This one caution, check the package. If the saturated fat is over four grams per serving, then I wouldn't consider eating it. Because once in a while we look at it and the, the serving of this meat analog, because of the addition of coconut oil usually, is over nine grams. The coconut ones. Yeah. One, uh, the way I see one of my jobs here is to help people love the foods that love them. And so I'm taking my neighbors, my relatives, and I'm saying, try this. And I at least can feel confident that for that one meal, they're reducing their saturated fat, helping to clear their cholesterol from their arteries instead of going the other way. And it takes a while, but what we've seen in the clinic, sometimes we'll see people every month for two years and they get brighter. It is just so exciting to see people get brighter the more they turn to these foods. And uh, so, but it's a slow transition. I, I believe in evolution more than revolution for food changes. Yeah, it's more permanent usually if people make changes step by step and then they, they have a success with the food like the chickens or the fish fillets and, and then they say, okay, this can work and let's, what's next? What do I try next? How, how about a burger? You know, and we tell them about the black bean burgers. They try those, and those are fantastic. You know, I don't even need to go to the beef anymore. And so step by step, you can get better without suffering. That's our point, right? That's our point. We we had one friend in the, who we saw, and he said, I tried kale. I hated it. So, you know, no one gave him a recipe. He didn't steam it. He just went like that to the edge. It's very it was sort of bitter and very chewy. So there are some tips and tricks for that. You can steam it. You can massage it till it gets moist and Catherine soft. Catherine has a cookbook, the uh, dementia, dementia prevention, prevention cookbook. cookbook. And she actually kindly gave that to the participants in the trial who were changing their diet. And it also is available on our website, drsteveblake.com. And I also talk about, I have four sections on the rationale for each food change. Why do we want to avoid the dairy products? Why do we want to, you know, what about saturated fats with some charts in there and so forth. So, Please tell us about the college textbook that you wrote for McGraw-Hill, <laughs> Vitamins and Minerals Demystified. Let's see. Well, some years back, uh, McGraw-Hill contacted me and asked me to write a book a college textbook on vitamins and minerals in their Demystified series. Their Demystified series has literally thousands of titles, and a lot of them are hard science like physics and chemistry. The idea being that it can be a self-learning book or can be used in a college with quizzes, midterms, and the final exams all built into the book. But they only gave me seven months to write it. It was a little tight. Boy, was I busy. But basically, I went through all of the necessary vitamins and all of the necessary minerals and told people about why they're necessary. It's a 30-page chapter on vitamin C. You wouldn't believe all of the reasons why we need vitamin C. We're really designed to eat it and because we can't make it. Most animals can. And also let people know about the amount and quality of the supplements for these things too, for each vitamin and mineral, because each one needs to be taken in the correct amount and in the correct form. Here's a picture of the book cover. I helped edit it when it was too difficult. I said, please make a cartoon or a graph for that. Yeah. So he added lots of There are a of lot of diagrams in consequence of her suggestions, and she did help me edit it too, so that the diagrams really help you understand how these things work. I, you know, there's one that show how calcium is attached to the bones. And it's hard to understand, but when you see a picture, all of a sudden it becomes clear. What are the 15 most important nutritional supplements that everyone should take? Now we should be eating, of course, a ton of carotenoids every day, but some days we miss. Today on the road in this hotel, I may have missed a few of those carotenoids. 
So I like to be sure I get these fat soluble antioxidants that protect my brain, my arteries, and everything in my body. So I would suggest that people take lutein and zeaxanthin. These are the ones that a brain like to concentrate more than any other carotenoid. Also, I think beta cryptoxanthin would be good to take along with beta carotene. These two can be made into vitamin A as well as being protective antioxidants. The flaxseed powder is a great addition to our diet and I think almost anyone could benefit from having some omega-3s in the plant-based alpha linolenic form. We are designed to eat a lot of vitamin C in nature, but foods have been changed and hybridized and made sweeter. And after all, vitamin C is very sour. So the foods now contain less than they did. So even though I am eating whole plants, I still don't usually get over 400 milligrams a day, but I take 1200 milligrams in divided doses after meals to boost vitamin C. 93% of Americans, did you know, don't get the bare minimum of vitamin E. Only 7% of Americans even get the bare minimum. So vitamin E is something we need to take, but there's a problem. The vitamin E in vitamins is not vitamin E. First of all, it's usually only the alpha tocopherol and they ignore the beta, gamma, and delta tocopherol. Second of all, the alpha tocopherol they're using is synthetic because it's cheap, but only one eighth of that is real alpha tocopherol. The other seven eighths are fake and they do not perform the function needed in our body. Four of them are completely worthless and three of them are nearly worthless. So it's very difficult to find a vitamin supplement. In our study, we did provide high quality vitamin E supplements, but we also made sure that people got one ounce of sunflower seeds each day and one ounce of walnuts each day to get the alpha tocopherol and the gamma tocopherol naturally. And that's always a good idea. We did both because we wanted people to get their brains well again. Oh, there's more, of course, <laughs> and we're not done. Uh, there are four minerals that support our own antioxidant systems. So selenium supports glutathione peroxidase. Without it, you cannot detoxify the hydrogen peroxide that's constantly made in our cells into water, but with it, you can. And then there are three minerals necessary for superoxide dismutase are zinc, copper and manganese. These are very important and we may not get them from our food every day. We have to be sure we get them so that our own antioxidant systems can protect. Our cells may get 10,000 to 100,000 free radical attacks every cell every day. We need to protect against these things. Let's see, what am I forgetting? You did calcium, right? I didn't do calcium, calcium. you're right. Uh, many people don't get enough calcium, especially people on plant diets. So it's a good idea to supplement calcium. And we supplement with a brain and body food, which has all of these things, except for the flax powder, it has everything in it already. The brain and body food, you wanna show them a picture? We, sure. When we were doing our Hawaii dementia prevention trial, the people who weren't in the trial wanted to get the supplements, but they couldn't, they were restricted to the participants. So we made this brain and body food with most of the things in the trial so that anybody can get it. And it is available on our website, drsteveblake.com, if you want to try it. And you want, you made sure it was the highest quality of everything, including the vitamin E. Oh yeah, the vitamin E was a problem with the manufacturer. They said, you can't put that in, that'll double the price. I said, I want this for my friends, my family, for people I care about, for the people who are trying to heal. I don't care. It didn't actually make the supplement expensive. We just lowered the profit margin. <laughs> and then the folate instead of folic acid. You yes. wanted to make sure you had yes. the highest quality of everything. Yeah, the, the folic acid is a synthetic analog of folate, the real B vitamin that's found in food in the human body. And if you're taking more than 1,000 micrograms a day, it can increase your risk of cancer. I would never want to do that. And since it's found in fortified grains, plus supplements, plus breakfast cereals, it is possible that you could go over that if you're taking a supplement with folic acid. So we use the real folate, and I would never recommend something that could increase cancer risk. I think that's most of the supplements. I might've gotten up to 15 there. Did you mention vitamin D supplements? And if so, which type of vitamin D should we take? The vitamin D is available in either D2, which is ergocalciferol made from irradiated fungus. I don't recommend that one. 
The cholecalciferol is a natural form in the human body, and I do recommend that one. That's called D3. So if you're taking D3, uh, the upper limit that has been set is 4,000 IUs a day or 100 micrograms per day. And I think that's a reasonable upper limit. People who supplement with that much tend to have their blood vitamin D go up to a good level. The minimum amount per day I would suggest would be 1,000 IUs or 25 micrograms per day. That works for most people. The key here is to check your blood, add it to your yearly or bi-yearly blood test. Just ask your doctor to throw in a vitamin D check and see how your vitamin D is when you're taking your supplements, see how much it raises. And if it doesn't raise enough, then you can bump your way up to 4,000 IUs a day or 100 micrograms in the newer terminology. How do we decide which brand of nutritional supplements to use? There are a lot of brands out there in the market. So one thing that you can do to look for quality is look first at the vitamin E. So you want to make sure that it's the RRR, and you'll find that very difficult to find. What you'll find instead is the D-alpha tocopherol or the D-L-alpha tocopherol vitamin E. And I have nicknamed the L, the D-L-alpha tocopherol. Those are long words, aren't they? D-L, just go D-L vitamin E, D-L tocopherol. I call it lousy, L for lousy, because that's where you're getting the artificial uh, chemicals that do not help the body and might even cause damage. So that's the first place to look if your vitamin your chances a for getting quality. a real vitamin E in a supplement are probably less than 1%. Another thing to look at is your amount of calcium that you're getting and the quality. Calcium carbonate is very difficult to assimilate and you may only be getting 3% assimilation out of taking 1,000 milligrams of calcium carbonate. Now it's the cheapest and it's the one that's out there in most supplements, but look further until you find citrate and malate uh, there are some others that are more assimilable, but they're harder to find. So calcium citrate and calcium malate are nice, easy to assimilate, and you'll get a higher percentage of the calcium. Now, we've looked at some of these raw vitamin, multivitamins, and I look at the package, and it says 45 milligrams of calcium, which is nothing. If you need 1,000 a day, even if it were assimilable, it's not going to help you enough. So that's another way to check your multivitamin and see if it has that. It is very, very difficult. Let's face it. Pharmaceutical manufacturers manufacture these things for one reason, and that reason is profit. And so they use the smallest amounts of the cheapest forms of everything. And this is, I guess, understandable for the stockholders of the company, but for consumers, it is a disaster. They think they're getting what they're getting, but they're not getting it. Although I've heard positive things about fruit, Brian Clement from the Hippocrates Health Institute says fruit is picked unripe and has been hybridized to be much sweeter than it originally was in nature and that it acts like any other sugar in our body and should be limited in consumption to just one or two pieces if we're healthy and zero if we have a health issue. Do you agree? Well, I certainly agree that our fruit has been hybridized, not just fruit, but vegetables too, have been hybridized. Uh, I looked, in fact, once at how many of our common foods have been hybridized, 2,200 common foods. That's pretty much all of it. So yes, they have been, and picked unripe, certainly a lot of fruit is picked unripe. I mean, bananas are picked unripe in Colombia and then gassed on the boat to America to try and ripen them up. Now, as far as the action of the sugar, there are some differences between fruit and eating, say, a high fructose corn syrup drink. And one of the differences is, of course, that fruit has a lot of antioxidants that are very valuable, whereas the drink may not have those. Another thing is that it is absorbed slower when you eat whole fruit. Now, fruit juice absorbs very quickly, just like a sugar, and dried fruit does too. But whole fruit absorbs more slowly because the sugar is complexed in and takes a while both to eat and takes a while to digest. So the key is to have our blood sugar at a stable good level and not shoot up too fast, too high. That's called the sugar rush and it's a lot of fun, but it's bad for us. So another thing that's interesting is a recent study came out showing that both apples and strawberries slowed the absorption of other sugars in the bloodstream. The polyphenols, these wonderful plant chemicals, slowed the absorption of sugar. So they were testing people taking a sugary drink along with 
either strawberries or apples, and they found that the absorption was slower. So there are some real differences. Now the key here is glycemic load, not glycemic index, but glycemic load. If it's under 10 with a fruit, such as watermelons, peaches, pears, any of the berries, they're all under 10 in glycemic load, which means they do not raise blood sugar unduly or quickly. So these I would consider safe even for diabetics. Now it's a shame that most doctors say eat no fruit if you're diabetic, because the damage to the arteries, the eyes, the kidneys, and the brain in diabetes from this excess blood sugar is mediated through a lack of antioxidants. And this fruit is loaded, especially the berries, with antioxidants. Vitamin C, lycopene, um yeah, Lots of all kinds of Pretty much all of them. <laughs> Another thing I want to point out is that uh, illness takes many forms. And if someone has constipation, well, then the smooth, gentle fiber of bananas is very helpful. Another thing, if someone has migraines from drinking Pepsi Cola all day, like my girlfriend, she could benefit from having some fruit instead of the Pepsi Cola or whatever beverage, you know, caffeinated beverage that she's choosing. It will give her protective antioxidants, it'll give her high fiber, and it'll be delicious and juicy, and satisfy the needs. So it depends on the illness. Uh, some benefit from more fruit and others. Uh, we heard Brian Clemens talk, and he's brilliant about, uh, he was talking about cancer and sugars, and I learned something from him. And so, Yes, with cancer, that may be a real issue. And they are brilliant with their vegetable juices. I have no qualms about that. I'm really impressed. But because cancer thrives with high blood sugar, doesn't mean that you can't eat fruit. Because these low glycemic load fruits do not raise your blood sugar. Now, mangoes and bananas are medium glycemic load. And people should be careful if they have cancer or diabetes not to eat these. But berries are always safe. In fact, in our trial, we used one cup of blueberries, strawberries, or red grapes every single day as part of the reason why people got a lot better rather than worse in their memory and thinking abilities. Which fats and oils do we want to avoid <laughs> and which do we want to consume and what's the basis for your opinion? <laughs> well, I wrote a textbook, uh, another one called Fats and Oils Demystified. And in this, I explain chapter by chapter what the fatty acids are what the triglycerides are, what cholesterol is, and how these fats occur in foods and how they're refined out of foods. So I do use that as, as my source uh, because it's based on good science, excellent peer-reviewed scientific literature. I feel there's a lot of misinformation about this. Humans require only two essential fatty acids. Linoleic acid is an omega-6, which we require, but everyone seems to get too much. So for linoleic acid, the omega-6, it would be better if we ate a little less, not more, even though it's an essential fatty acid. Omega-3 fatty acid from plants is alpha-linolenic acid, and this one is low in most diets. I analyze diets with my diet doctor software constantly, and I see that this is often low. That's why I recommend the flaxseed powder, because that keeps your omega-3s at a reasonable level. So these are the only two fatty acids that humans need. Do we need saturated fat? No. Humans do not require it. We manufacture that in our livers. We manufacture palmitic acid and just enough to do what we need, but not extra, hopefully, unless we're eating too many saturated fats. Do we need long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids like DHA, which is docosahexaenoic acid, or EPA, which is eicosapentaenoic acid? No, we really don't. We just like Vitamin D, which we make in our bodies, we also make these in our bodies. Now, there's a whole chapter in my book, Fats and Oils Demystified, that talks about how we make this EPA from the plant-based omega-3s. And it's true, we do need some other nutrients in order to make this happen. But it is certainly possible to make it happen. So, what else is there to know? We need two essential fatty acids. We do not need any other fat in our diet except for extra calories, which a lot of Americans would do better without. Here's a picture of his, there are several books that Steve wrote. It's almost scary. Here we have <laughs> the fats and oils demystified. There's an avocado, olives, a variety of nuts and seeds, 
and I don't know what's over there, but. Indicating that we should get all of our fats and oils from whole intact foods like nuts and seeds, avocados, and olives rather than refined oils. Which fat soluble nutrients are essential and which are desirable? Oh, that's a great question. The fat soluble nutrients are vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. These are the fat soluble nutrients. Now carotenoids are also fat soluble nutrients and many of the polyphenols are fat soluble too, such as, uh, well, the uh, curcuminoids from turmeric, they are fat soluble too. But it is difficult to absorb these nutrients and sometimes people don't get enough. As I mentioned, vitamin E is lacking in the American diet. Now, some people are eating very low fat diets, such as 10% of their calories is fat or less. It's very difficult to stay on because it's hard to be satisfied with this. But they're also not able to absorb the fat soluble nutrients, such as vitamin E and the carotenoids, because they're not getting any fatty triggers to trigger digestion of these things. You have to trigger the bile. There's a hormone called cholecystokinin yep. that triggers the bile, and then the bile is able to mycelize the vitamin E so it can be absorbed. Basically, it surrounds it with water-soluble fragments so that the intestine can absorb it in. If this doesn't happen, then you simply don't absorb the amount of vitamin E or carotenoids that you're getting. So these are the fat-soluble nutrients. They are crucial for health and the brain. So simply put, to reiterate, you need some form of fat in a meal uh, that has fat soluble antioxidants in it, like green leafy vegetables. Your or creamy carotenoids. walnut dressing would work. Yes. So uh, even a few almonds will work. You don't need a lot, but you need enough to trigger that fat digestion. And of course, you need to actually be eating the vitamin E, for instance, before you can get it. And as we mentioned, vitamin D should be supplemented in most people. You've mentioned bad saturated fats. Uh, are there, there are good ones also? No, there are no good ones. But avocado has a, like a, a Well, a saturated small amount, fats a half, are a gram. found a little bit in any food with any fat content, but they're not desirable. Now, there are the three saturated fatty acids that are very well proven to increase atherosclerotic plaque, strokes, heart disease, vascular dementia, and those are lauric, myristic, and palmitic acid. So those three would be considered extremely bad. There's a 18 carbon steric acid, which is a saturated fat that's also found a lot in, well, it's named after steers, so you get the idea. This one, our bodies can split into, can put a point of desaturation in the middle and make it into oleic acid, thus sort of detoxifying it. So it doesn't contribute to cholesterol raising the arteries so much, although it does contribute to higher triglycerides. Oleic being a monounsaturated. Yes. So there are also some small short chain fatty acids like capric, caproic, and caprylic acid. These are very short chain and they are absorbed in a different way than the longer chain ones. They go right into the portal blood circulation, right to the liver, and they're burned as fat. So they're about as useful as sugar. The only time they're really effective is when someone is having a malabsorption syndrome, they're in the hospital, they're losing weight dramatically, then they have a drink made from these short chain fatty acids that can at least get some calories into their body. But for the rest of us, they're not desirable. They're unavoidable, but they're not desirable. What are trans fats? Where do you find them and what's wrong with eating them? <laughs> <laughs> trans fats are they start out usually as linoleic acid or other polyunsaturated fatty acids, sometimes even monounsaturated fatty acids. They're basically changed so that instead of being bent in a three-dimensional structure, they're straight and flat. So they go from that to that. When they're so put they into a cell membrane, anymore. they pack together a lot closer and they prevent those transmembrane proteins from implanting. One of them is LDL that pulls the LDL out of the blood. Well, if you have less LDL receptors, that LDL circulates longer and longer. And that's true of both saturated fatty acids and trans fatty acids. Trans fatty acids are found, of course, in hydrogenated oils, partially hydrogenated oils. So if you see that on the label, you might not want to eat it. Crisco, lard. 
yeah, pretty much. There are many, many junk food and snack foods that have these partially hydrogenated oils. Popcorn butter. What about if it says zero trans fats on the label? Look at the portion size. They're getting very clever. You know, if it you means only there's eat less two. than half a gram per serving. So they just make the serving smaller. So it looks like there's none in the product. So you, it's really tricky. You need to actually read the ingredients, look for partially hydrogenated this or that, and then reject the product. Now, people think that the only way to get trans fatty acids is from industrial process where they take a cheap liquid oil and they put it in a reactor vat with a cobalt catalyst. And they are, the purpose is to make it saturated, which is not a good idea. But the side effect is to get some trans fats in there too. But there's another way that people get their trans fats, and that's from biohydrogenation in the rumen of cattle or sheep or goats. These animals can actually make trans fats, and it's been found in different diets throughout the world. In Canada, it's about 50-50 of the trans fats from biohydrogenation from beef and milk compared to the industrially processed trans fats. There is no known difference between the damaging health effects of trans fats from animal products or from industrial hydrogenation. They all contain the same trans fats, there's a little more vaccinic acid in the animal products, and there's a little more of the other acids in the industry hydro hydrogenated oils. Elatic acid is the one that's raised in those. But they all have the same trans fats, and they're all damaging to the body, and they all should be avoided. Another good reason to avoid beef and dairy products. What is the relationship between cholesterol in food and cholesterol in our blood? And what's the basis for your opinion? <laughs> Well, cholesterol in food is not the primary cause of cholesterol in the blood, although it does raise it a little bit. In fact, I have a study here in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that showed that 100 milligrams of dietary cholesterol raises total cholesterol just about 2.2. A recent study in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition showed that if you do eat about 400 milligrams of cholesterol in your diet, which is quite common, then you might bump up your total cholesterol about eight or 10%. Now, this isn't the primary problem with cholesterol. The primary problem is oxidized cholesterol. Whenever you cook anything with cholesterol, whether it's eggs or beef or any animal product really that has cholesterol, what's happening is the cholesterol is becoming oxidized. And the oxidized cholesterol is a real problem. It gets into your bloodstream and it collects in the atherosclerotic plaque that plugging plaque that contributes toward heart attacks and strokes and vascular dementia. Also, it enters the brain. Now, cholesterol can't enter the brain because of the blood-brain barrier, but oxidized cholesterol can. And whenever your total body burden of cholesterol is high, the cholesterol gets oxidized, partially because the animal products don't have antioxidants, so you're low in antioxidants. Then this cholesterol gets into your brain, the oxidized part, and it causes inflammation and damage to the brain cells killing off brain cells. Another thing about cholesterol that's dietary is if you were to eat, say, a shrimp omelet, which would be about the highest you could get in cholesterol, maybe 800 to 1,000 milligrams of cholesterol at once, this can cause the cholesterol to form crystals in the walls of the blood vessels. These cholesterol crystals are very sharp. Now, you know people live many years with clogged arteries. Well, this sharp cholesterol crystals can break the plaque, cause it to form a flap and plug an artery. If it's a heart artery, it's a heart attack. If it's a brain artery, it's a stroke. If it's a little artery, it's vascular dementia. So we don't really want to eat any cholesterol in our diets at all, which means no animal fat at all, which is the healthiest way to live. So you're saying it becomes oxidized when it's cooked? It becomes oxidized when it's cooked, or if it enters the body, it becomes oxidized in the body, also we have enzymes that oxidize cholesterol. So then you get oxidized cholesterol when the body's trying to get rid of it. So any way you cut it, if you're eating any animal fat with cholesterol, then you're going to have problems in your body. I, was, I was surprised when uh, a few years ago I looked at your diet doctor software and I was looking at various foods that were high in cholesterol. And uh, Steak, I looked that up, was about 70 milligrams for four ounces. Okay, how about salmon? People talk about 68, salmon. Right? 68. Well, guess what? Two eggs, 350. 
milligrams of cholesterol. So it's a lot higher in dietary cholesterol. And the shrimp is about 350 or 400 also per serving. So that's why he was saying you're getting about 800 milligrams of dietary cholesterol. And that this study had shown that it uh, kind of doubled the amount. I is that right? In well, the body? The oxidized cholesterol is very damaging. And it's very rare that people eat, say, a raw egg, which doesn't have oxidized cholesterol. But it has so much cholesterol that your entire body burden of cholesterol is so high that it will oxidize in your body, enter your brain, increase inflammation in your brain, and damage your brain and kill off brain cells. This is not desirable. Can you please remind me what the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition said about that the was dietary about cholesterol? Dietary cholesterol, if you eat 400 milligrams, you're going to raise your total cholesterol by only 8 to 10 milligrams, or 8 okay. to 10 um, units. Okay. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Milligrams per deciliter is the unit. Okay. So clarify for me the ideal cholesterol level and what the ideal HDL cholesterol level is. Well, the average American cholesterol for total cholesterol is 220. And many doctors tell people if they're under 220 or even if they're at 220, they say your cholesterol's fine. It's normal. Don't worry about it. But on the average, people in America get a heart attack two or three times a minute. That's average too. That's not what we want. We want less. So many doctors are now saying, well, let's get it under 200. And that's a little difficult to do if you're eating animal fat. It's almost impossible. And some studies, like the Framingham study noted, that went on for so many years, that people with a total cholesterol of under 150 had no heart attacks or strokes at all. They simply didn't occur in that range. So I think that one goal would be to get it under 170 for total cholesterol. It seems a more achievable goal. If you can get it down to 150, that would be super. But to do this, you're going to need to go on a whole food plant diet because if you're eating animal products, you're unlikely to achieve this. However, your risk of heart attacks and stroke will reduce dramatically. You want to tell them about uh, Betty. The Betty, yes. Oh, uh, we had a woman in uh, the clinic who had a stroke. And one of our fellow, uh, a doctor in the clinic, saw her in the emergency room. And the woman told her, I do not want to take drugs. So she sent the woman to us. Now, she was 80 years old and her cholesterol was 357. 374. 374, her blood serum Even cholesterol, worse. really high, which caused the stroke, right? So with us, we discussed dietary changes. Now, she had been used to having cream cheese and salmon every day for lunch and cheese and crackers with wine at dinner and coffee with a lot of thick creamer in the morning normal enough behavior. This is what caused the high cholesterol for her. So we suggested her switching off to a silk almond hazelnut creamer. Which she loved. Which she loved in her coffee and has no problems with the dietary cholesterol. And then for lunch, we switched her to some, uh, well, we suggested hummus dip and some other dips. And also smart butter. And smart butter. Earth Balance or one of the butters that doesn't have trans fats, but is, it doesn't also have this saturated fat. And there are some delicious non-dairy cheese substitutes out there. So we switched her to a sour cream or cream cheese that was a non-dairy. So she made these changes. This Little by little. This hot dressing 80-year-old lady. Uh, she also exercised some, but she'd done that the whole time. She came back six months later, and her cholesterol test showed she was down. 220, to, right? 212. 212, OK. And then six months later, it was down to 144. I want to tell you, the doctors in the clinic had to come in and see the actual blood test results because they didn't believe. Even with statins, you couldn't get it from 374 to 144 in one year. And dietary alone. She had already been a fitness buff, walking up and down she malls just and highways I mean, and counting she, her steps. Yeah. And she was an athletic, very intelligent lady. But she went from uh, 374 cholesterol and a stroke in the emergency room, this side of dying, to becoming in the heart attack proof zone of Un cleaned arteries. Unfortunately, after a year, we no longer could make appointments with Betty because she had graduated. We graduated. Her chances her. of a stroke had gotten down to just about. Zero. Yeah, we said, you're, you're there, girl.
at least as far as an ischemic stroke goes, which makes up 85% of stroke. And, and she still kept some of her other foods. Mostly, she just changed her dairy and got rid of the high cholesterol saturated fats in the dairy. So if she can do it, you can do it too. Yes, it was very exciting. Which is healthier? A salad with cooked quinoa and chickpeas, <laughs> or a salad with raw chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and sesame seeds? <laughs> okay, so what I did is I put this into my Diet Doctor software analysis tool, shown here by Vanna White, almost. And I looked at it, and well, the, um, the quinoa and the chickpeas came out to 23 grams of protein, and, and I didn't analyze the salad, just the quinoa and chickpeas. And the, if you put together, just I used one cup of chickpeas, one cup of quinoa, a reasonable amount. And then I used one ounce of each of those seeds. And when I added it up, the protein was 34 from the seeds, so a little higher. The calories were 491. Now that's a very reasonable size for a meal. If you did that three times a day, you'd be losing weight. Uh, on the other hand, it was 823 calories for the seeds. Seeds, when you eat, and that's six ounces of seeds. It's not that much, is it? But they're very dense calorically. So they added quite a lot. If you ate that three times a day, you'd likely be gaining weight at 2,400 calories per day. Now, the saturated fat was fascinating. With the chickpeas and the quinoa, one cup each, the saturated fat was 0.8 grams. Excellent. You're never going to go over with something like that. The saturated fat for the six ounces of these six nuts and seeds was 7.9. Now, this is more than a fast food hamburger saturated fat. So you really have to be a little bit careful eating too much fat, even from these healthy seeds. It added up because there were just too many of them. Uh, 7.9 grams of saturated fat, you get 11 per day. You're very likely to go over that day. Now, the alpha linolenic acid, our, our basic plant-based omega-3, was only 0.3 in the chickpeas and quinoa, not enough. On the other hand, in all those seeds, it was 12.8. Now, our daily need is about 2 or 3. 12.8 is too much. If you get too much of the ALA, you can actually reduce your ability of your immune system to fight cancer and infections. So you're not really doing you yourself a favor black with and blues, too much. Bleeding. Yeah, even, even bleeding problems can Thinner arise skin. probably at higher levels than this. Um, now, the vitamin E levels were a little low at four for the quinoa and chickpeas. If you ate three meals, you'd get 12. You'd still be under the 15 you need per day. The vitamin E was excellent for the seeds at 24 milligrams, all you need for a whole day. So in a way, it's interesting to actually analyze these two things so that you can see their pluses and their minuses. And that's the way I do it. I use the Diet Doctor software. It is available at drsteveblake.com. If you want to analyze your own diet, these things are invisible. So the software makes them visible. If this were my kitchen, I would choose one or two of the seeds that mm -hmm. are high in the alpha linolenic acid, the omega-3. For example, the flax seeds and maybe chia seeds as well. But I wouldn't also. Um, you wouldn't do. I all wouldn't six. do hemp seeds as well. I wouldn't eat all three, and I would choose maybe one of the sunflower seeds or pumpkin seeds. I don't need them every single meal. And then I would mix and match. So I would have some of the chickpeas and quinoa, which provide excellent nutrition and different nutrients than mm -hmm. the seeds do, and That's some good. of the seeds. So I'd have a wonderful salad combining them both. In fact, we do that. We do. <laughs> we do. The way to go. We uh, do. Interesting, isn't it? Is it okay to cook with oil? Some have said that cooking any oil is not good since cooking makes all oils dangerous. I might go one step further and say using oil is not a good idea. I have a whole chapter in my book, Fats and Oils Demystified, that's dedicated to seeing what happens to an innocent, say, sunflower seed when it's made into sunflower seed oil. And one of the first steps is to grind it up and soak it in hexane. Now, when you fill your car with gasoline, you see that vapor coming off the top? It's mostly hexane. It's a neurotoxin. Residues remain. There are no limits in the U.S., although Canada and in the EU do limit the amount of hexane. How much hexane, hexane per C? Too much. Oh, how much they use? Yeah. I thought, well, they probably just put in a, a couple teaspoons of hexane in every, every ton of seeds, so that's probably not a problem. Then I looked it up. They actually use a ton or two of hexane per ton of ground up seeds. 
So there's a huge amount. Now they try and extract it back because just to conserve it so they can use it for the next batch. But as I say, and one of the main reasons they try and lower it is because hexane's so flammable that the box cars will explode if the residues are too high. That's from the mash left over from making the oil. Okay, then what do they do with this? <laughs> anyway, the process of making oil involves heating quite a few steps. Even if it's cold pressed, it's heated. So what happens when you heat any oil is you create reactionary products called malondialdehyde that can cause DNA adducts and increase a risk of cancer. Also, of course, the oil is stripped out of most of its vitamin E, all of its fiber, almost every mineral that's beneficial. It's basically pure calories like white sugar. So if you take a, sugar, a beet and reduce it to beet sugar, it's similar in some ways to taking a seed or a bean or a nut and reducing that to an oil. That's why I like to get our fats and oils from whole intact nuts and seeds. It's fine if you want to use a nut butter or a creamy walnut dressing, blend it, grind it up. Okay, now ask me the same question. Is it okay to cook with oil? Okay, so don't tell Steve, but <laughs> occasionally I sneak some oils in and I like occasionally toasted sesame oil for flavor. But what I do most of the time is I choose vegetables that I can, if they have a little bit of water in them already, um, zucchini, mushrooms, I can put them in a pan, I use a cast iron skillet, and I put a lid on it, and low or medium low heat, and it starts to sweat. It provides its own moisture, so it doesn't stick to the pan. Then I could, it can put in other garlic or um, onions that could stick if I used no oil. So I'm starting off without oil in most cases. Then I'll add a tiny bit of water if I feel that it needs that. Then I add spices, whatever I'm in the mood for that we need that day, using them medicinally in our food, and I can create wonderful vegetables without using oils most of the time. But and as I say, for if we're having company over or something, I'll, I'll break out the And the bottle. reason she uses sesame oil is because it has a heat activated antioxidant that helps offset sesame. the carcinogenic tendency of rancid heated oils. So uh, sesame oil is perhaps the best oil to use if you're going to heat it up, heat, use the minimum amount and heat it the minimum amount. And that'll be the safest. And then what I'll do is, uh, instead of the oil, I'll make a, one of my many uh, toppings. Uh, Best Friends is another one that I make that's just great. It's a cashews and red bell peppers cut the same size, uh, simmered at the same time, low heat for a while covered. And they make an incredibly wonderful topping. Now, um, bell, you know, organic, Red bell peppers are wonderful. They're very high in vitamin C. They're even high in nicotine, which is helpful for Parkinson's disease patients, mm -hmm. who we've seen a lot of. And then the cashews are nice, sweet, delicious nut. They provide some vitamin E. And it's and a the, topping. You and it's, put it and on there's anything. the topping. Delicious. That's, or gomacio or garlic gomacio. So on a salad, uh, instead of, of chug-a-lugging the olive oil, she puts this topping on. It's delicious. Yeah. So it's instead of a sauce sometimes, too. Why is hexane included in the seeds? It's a solvent that allows for greater profit by the manufacturers of oils. Hexane is not always used. Sometimes they use gasoline or carbon tetrachloride, known as dry cleaning fluid. None of these things are any good for us. They're used simply to maximize profit, and they are not regulated in the US as far as residues go, although they are in most of the rest of the world. And I think they should be. Organic oils, by the way, are forbidden to use hexane. So organic sesame oil would be your best choice. Again, tiny amounts, rarely used, and not heated much. Which nuts and seeds are healthiest and least healthy? Uh, others have said to avoid peanuts and cashews. I think the healthiest nut or seed would be walnuts, wouldn't you say? Yes, yeah, as long as they have, they're fresh and not rancid. Yes, of course. If they taste bitter, then they, they're no longer fresh enough to be good. You know, nuts and seeds vary quite a bit. Again, I checked my dietary analysis tool and um, looked at the different nuts and seeds here. The vitamin E in sunflower seeds, 36 milligrams. They're great. Black walnuts, 32 milligrams. Almonds, 27 milligrams. But peanuts only have eight milligrams. So they're a little lower in vitamin E than the others. Coconut meat, 0.8 milligrams, almost nothing. 
and cashews 6.6 .6 milligrams. Again, a little lower than most of them. However, cashews are the second highest in copper and iron. So perhaps uh, some people who are trying to get enough copper and iron might want to include cashews. However, cashews are third lowest in calcium. Coconuts, of course, are even lower. Now, peanuts are used widely in China. That's the main nut that they eat. They're the highest in protein, niacin, and folate. We mentioned folate as being a crucial nutrient. Niacin is a crucial nutrient for keeping our blood vessels open and working. So, and they're highest in protein in case you happen to be needing some more of that. Most people get too much. So really, there's a balance in the nuts. It might be a good idea to mix and match a little bit, but I, I do prefer walnuts and almonds. Personally, I like to eat them every day. You mentioned coconut oil much earlier. You just mentioned coconut meat. My question is, in general, are coconut meat, coconut milk, and coconut oil good or bad for our health? There's only one answer to that. <laughs> All three are bad for our health. And they're bad because of their high saturated fat content. Coconut oil is 84 to 92% saturated. And as I mentioned, 65% of the oils are the three that clog our arteries. It's deadly stuff. We should stay away from it. Also, as I mentioned, it has virtually no vitamin E, virtually no phytosterols, which take uh, calcium and prevent it from being introduced into the body. So they lower our blood cholesterol. Uh, the, let's see, I did write down the amount. There's 30% of the meat is saturated fat. In the milk, it's 21%. And in the oil, like I said, 83 to 92%. These are very high. Just to compare, the oil has twice as much saturated fat as lard or butter. And I know there's a lot of people who would shudder to eat lard or butter, but are gobbling down coconut oil. It seems to be a bit of a fad, and I will say that your term coconut oil is a bit of a misnomer. In lipid terminology, any fat, when it's solid at room temperature, is called a fat. If it's liquid at room temperature, it's called an oil. And we all know that coconut oil is solid at room temperature, hence the proper term is coconut fat. Hard for the marketers to sell it as a coconut fat, though. Okay, now I'd like to answer that also. Okay. We live on Maui, and there are a lot of people who do fasting, and they just drink coconut water. Coconut water is fine, by Excellent. the way. It's got the electrolytes, and it's, it's just lovely, effervescent. Mm -hmm. More potassium than a banana. And it tastes different at different stages in the coconut's life, which is fun, too. Uh, yeah, and the real coconut water that we get by cracking coconuts is worlds better than the bottled stuff. But it, the bottled stuff's still good if it's not added sugar. So then let's move on to the coconut meat. We have friends who are raw food or who do somewhat like fasting. And they can probably handle a little bit of the saturated fat that comes in the coconut meat. So on Maui, first of all, we have many palm trees with coconuts on our property. And occasionally we'll crack a coconut. But you know what? You get full. You eat a few bites and it takes a long time to chew. And it's a little fatty. And you feel like, okay, I've had enough of that. Thank it's you very, very much. It's very fibrous. It's not like coconut oil where it's so easy to overdo it. So those people who are having very little saturated fats elsewhere in their life can probably handle it. If their limit is 11 grams per day and they're getting five grams in some coconut meat on occasion, they can handle it. Now about the coconut milk, I personally I really enjoy Thai yellow curry with coconut milk. I love it. I started reading the cans and 55 milligrams of saturated fat means I can only eat a fifth of a can, and then I'm getting my whole day's worth of saturated fat. So I'm down to only having my delicious fa favorite Thai yellow curry with coconut milk only once every month or two as a treat instead of every day. So only one fifth of a can of coconut milk is maxing grams, out yeah. your whole day for saturated fat. And there's nothing good about these saturated fats. So where I'm at is I'm not saying no, never. I'm saying be aware, be advised, educate yourself, and use it on occasion as appropriate. There's a province in China with 750,000 men under 65 without any heart attacks because they eat a diet that doesn't create any plaque. Can you tell us more about this? The county is Guizhou County, and this was discovered in the China study. 
by Dr. Campbell. And in this county, the people eat plants. The only animal food that ever touches them is a little bit of lard used to keep their pans greasy or their woks greasy. They use a tiny amount of that. Because they eat only plant food and their saturated fat is low, their cholesterol is low, their arteries are clear, and you simply can't get an ischemic heart attack unless you have arterial clogging, which they don't. So none of them had it. The equivalent for America would be hundreds of men getting heart attacks because of the way we eat here. Now, are Chinese people immune to heart attacks? Not at all. In the cities in China, where they eat higher saturated fat diets and where you can find these things, they get heart attacks like everybody else. What does the science say about the effectiveness of cholesterol-lowering drugs on preventing heart attacks and death? And what are the side effects of the drugs? Statins do reduce blood cholesterol. And the proper way for people to get rid of statins is to eat a plant diet that's low in saturated fat, get a blood test, take it to the doctor and say, look, my cholesterol's really gone down. Can I cut my statin dose down? And perhaps a doctor will say, okay, we'll go to half dose. And the next test they get, they'll say, look, my cholesterol's even lower. And he'll say, it's even lower? Well, you don't need the statins anymore. Now, what statins are, are hydroxymethylglutaryl, coenzyme A reductase inhibitors. And what they do is they stop the production of mevalonate and farnesyl in the body. Now, this stops the production of both cholesterol and coenzyme Q10. The cholesterol production, of course, is desirable in the body unless having external sources. And the coenzyme Q10 is a vital part of our body, absolutely necessary for energy production and the only fat-soluble antioxidant that humans make. 40% reduction by the average statin user. And this can result in side effects of rhabdomyolysis, a muscle disease in some people who take it, aches and pains, lack of energy. There are a lot of side effects to statins. So I encourage anyone taking statins to use this approach to go to a whole plant diet lower your cholesterol until your doctor refuses to prescribe you any more statins, and then you're done with them. And muscle deterioration over time? Yes, that, that is and one of the side mitochondrial effects. dysfunction? Well, that's the mitochondrial dysfunction is from the lack of coenzyme Q10. Now, it would be good if everyone who took statins also took coenzyme Q10, which we use in our study, and it is very safe and naturally produced in our bodies. We do produce a little less as we get older. In our study, the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, we had people take 200 milligrams a day of the ubiquinol form of coenzyme Q10. However, dietary coenzyme Q10 has a tough time getting into the cells, into the mitochondria where it's needed, where the statins are interrupting the ability of our bodies to make it. So it would really be better if people can lower their cholesterol enough to where they don't need statins. You mentioned unequivocally earlier the correlation of cholesterol to heart attacks and stroke. Uh, what else can we do to prevent them? To prevent heart attacks and stroke? Well, you know, stress is a big factor, and you can do a lot about de-stressing yourself. Exercise is a huge factor. Steady, regular aerobics, but be careful. Start slowly, very gradually increase your aerobics, and make sure that your doctor or another professional is giving you a target range. For me, at my age, it's 120 to 140 is my pulse rate, that's my target range. If I go over 140, I start breathing too hard. If I go under 120, I stop breathing hard at all. And that's my aerobic range. So make sure you get a target zone in there. Also, of course, anti-inflammatories and antioxidants are crucial for preventing atherosclerotic plaque because of the inflammation and the oxidative damage that really make it worse. So the LDL is a transporter. It's made in the liver first as VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. As it circulates, the triglycerides are pulled from it as it docks to LDL receptors throughout the body and they pull out the triglycerides. Unfortunately, if it gets oxidized because we're not getting enough vitamin E, for instance, and other antioxidants, then it can damage the signaling recognition protein, the apolipoproteins as they're called, and it no longer can dock and get its contents taken out. So it circulates <clears throat> until it's more oxidized and sticks to the inside of a cell. It becomes atherosclerotic plaque.
My simple answer to that question <laughs> is to help people prevent getting strokes and heart attacks, start experimenting with different fruits and vegetables at the grocery store. Start experimenting with cooking different grains. It's just a matter of how much water and time is needed to cook them. They're wonderful. Start experimenting with recipes in different whole food cookbooks and start little by little pulling yourself away from the uh, processed foods and the foods in the middle of the grocery stores that are going to be providing you with too much saturated fat and leading you down the wrong road. I call those foods false friends. They pretend they're going to make you healthy, but in general, they're going to make you sick in the long run. So it's a long journey, but you can start today with experimenting with just one different fruit or vegetable and take the first step towards a healthier tomorrow. Tell us about the 2018 large prospective study in China that found that vitamin C reduced the risk of stroke by 54%. Yes, this was in the Journal of Epidemiology Community Health, a 2018 study. There are 948 people in the study, and it ran for 16 years. What I like about the study is that they looked at vitamin C in plasma and didn't just rely upon food frequency questionnaires, because people aren't always that accurate. And it did reduce the frequency of cardiovascular disease 59% and the, the stroke 54%. So in other words, it more than cut in half the incidence of these deadly problems just by having enough vitamin C. Now, vitamin C is often seen as a marker for the intake of fruits and vegetables, which have many compounds which are very protective of heart disease. However, in this study, they found that supplements that raise plasma, vitamin C, also work just as well. So it's a good idea to keep that vitamin C flowing into your body, perhaps through both routes. That's a meta study? No, that's an actual clinical trial okay. that ran so long with so many people. Oh, great, great. When are you for pharmaceutical drugs and when are you against them? As author of Mosby's Drug Guide for Nurses, fourth edition, co-author on that book, uh, I will say that I have explored the uses of pharmaceutical drugs quite in depth and I am very much for pharmaceutical drugs when they're necessary. My goal is to make the pharmaceutical drugs kind of like the Maytag man who, if the machines never break, he's never doing anything. I would like to make it so that people don't need them. But when they're necessary, such as in an emergency room, I think they're absolutely necessary. And like I said, with statins, they're needed to reduce cholesterol down to a reasonable level, but then we can get off the statins by eating a whole plant diet and having our doctors say, you don't need these anymore. So when drugs are necessary, I think that's fine. And it's life-saving and we're very grateful to have them in our lives. Perhaps it's not the right idea that our modern medical system, their first choice for any problem is medication. The first choice might be, in my book, if something is not acute, if it's not very urgent, that perhaps there's other things we can do. For instance, for convalescent care, drugs might not be the first choice. Perhaps herbs could be a good choice there. Something gentle and effective that will help us over a long period of time. Unfortunately, our medical system is really geared toward medication. I think they are overused. Uh, in a clinic, in the neuroscience clinic that we worked in, we saw that people became um, addicted to the drugs. They had to use them for the rest of their lives. And in many cases, the medical doctors did not see any other options. So that was rather disturbing to see. I understand that that's what they do and that's what they're experts in. And I could see the benefits in the patients. But if we can dial up the health of the patients to where they can take care of the problem with their own bodies and not rely on the drugs, little by little, with their doctors overseeing dosage uh, use, then that is an ideal way to go. Now, Steve and I met over 30 years ago where we were both uh, really, I'd say experts in herbal medicine. And he wrote the Herb Doctors a CD uh, on herbal medicine. The Herb Doctors have actually been working on for over 35 years now. It's gotten bigger. From 54 countries and regions worldwide, 
I have read herb books and put every bit of knowledge into this database to the point where there are now 168,000 footnoted references. And what I do is it automatically correlates it so that you can see where the top people in the world agree on the use of these plants for various illnesses, virtually every illness you could get. Uh, but I want to amplify that. For instance, for diabetes, yes, there are drugs like metformin that are routinely given for diabetes. However, there's another approach. And many doctors like uh, Neil Barnard and Terry Shintani, these people have done trials where people are reversing their diabetes in a matter of weeks with a change in diet. So there might be another way to treat these things rather than just using medication. But it does take more time and trouble than a 15 minute prescription writing session with a doctor in order to get the real scoop on how to reverse diabetes. I do have a book called Diabetes Breakthrough, The Key to Insulin Resistance. It's my latest book. And it talks about how to reduce insulin resistance rather than just working on all the carbohydrate going in. You have to look at how the sugars get out of the bloodstream and into the cells where they're needed. And the way to do this is to gain more insulin sensitivity. And this can be done principally with lowering saturated fat. I want to back up one step, please. Mm -hmm. With the allopathic medicine, uh, the treatment for the disease, we found that the herbal applications were often used in a similar way. Oh, you have this problem, let's give you something to relieve it. And in many cases they did, which was fantastic. But as Steve has said in an earlier date, it's difficult to overcome pounds of wrong food with ounces of herbal medicine or even grams of allopathic uh, chemical drug medicine. So it is the food that really can make the stronger difference in our lives in the long run. So although we love the herbal medicine, we've switched over pretty much to how the food can be, especially medicine. By the way, this is my latest book, Diabetes Breakthrough. If you need help, you can get the download for under $10 on my website, drsteveblake.com. How many deaths a year are there from medical mistakes in hospitals? Recent study in the British Medical Journal, 2016, calculated the number of deaths from accidents from medical mistakes only in hospitals, and they totaled up to 251,000 deaths per year. This is quite a lot. This would be the third biggest death rate in the country, you know, after only heart attacks and cancer. However, the study only looked at medical mistake deaths in hospitals. Many deaths are a result of using medication in a FDA approved manner. Also, the study did not look at any of the deaths from medical mistakes or other drug problems in outpatient clinics, in old age homes, or anywhere else. So it is quite possible that the deaths per year from medical mistakes could be larger than 251,000 deaths per year. And this is a disgraceful number of deaths per year. How can someone minimize their chance of being part of a medical mistake. Stay out of the hospital. Be so healthy that they don't want you there. And of course, the best way to do that is with a carefully thought out whole plant diet and perhaps a few supplements, like we mentioned vitamin B12 and vitamin D. These help along the way too. It's interesting because we met a wonderful man a few years ago. He was about 53, maybe younger, and a surfer and an avid runner great looking guy, incredible athlete. I mean, from the looks of him, you couldn't get any healthier than that. Well, a month later, we learned he had died of a heart attack. Wow. So it's not always what people look like. All the fitness in the world can't overcome the clogged arteries. So what we need to do to stay out of the hospital is keep our arteries fresh and clean and young. And the only way you can do that, the only way to reverse the problems, as far as I have found, is a plant-based diet. Yeah, Prevent and Reverse Disease by Caldwell Esselstyn is a great book for seeing examples of people who have reversed the arterial clogging, especially in heart arteries. And uh, you can get the book and learn how to do it yourself. I also have a book called uh, <laughs> No More Heart Attacks. <laughs> you have so many books, honey. And it's... that one um, See. describes the same idea as Caldwell Esselstyn and how to reverse the clogging of the arteries and stop it from happening. Arthritis. 
is at 70 million people in the U.S. Is it reversible, and if so, how? <laughs> well, it's not exactly reversible, the cartilage loss. Because once the cartilage is lost in between the joints, it can't really be regrown. However, the pain and inflammation can be eased dramatically by anti-inflammatory, well, medical plants, like Boswellia and um, turmeric are two of the best ones. It's just new research is coming out with a purple passion fruit peels seem to be really effective at re reducing this too. And there are many ways to reduce the pain and inflammation in arthritis. And I did teach a university class in arthritis. And, and people, what happened? Tell people, people would be coming in on walkers and wheelchairs and canes. And uh, Arthritis Relief is the book. You can also find that on my website. Inexpensive download. I want people to get this information. When people would come in, at the first class, I'd say, I describe arachidonic acid and its role. It comes mostly from turkey, chicken, and eggs, although other animal fat also contains large amounts of it. So I would ask for volunteers in the first class, no more turkey, chicken, and eggs until our next class next week. That's one week. Okay. And I always get volunteers. These people are desperate. They're in pain. A lot of motivation there. And the next week, I'd say, what happened? And they'd say things like, I'm walking twice as far. I'm sleeping through the night without I'm pain. Swimming. I'm taking half the number of pain medications I used to take. And the reason is simple. What do the pain medications do? They block arachidonic acid from forming inflammatory leukotrienes and painful prostaglandins. Well, why eat the arachidonic acid that makes these conditions and then try and negate that with drugs that have side effects? Why not just cut that back? So that's one of the easy ways to really cut back on the pain. Now, uh, beans have phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylinositol, and the other phospholipids that form the, the synaptic fluid that is the lubricator of our knees and other joints. That also can really ease arthritis. In my book, I have many different ways that are not drug-based, that are healthy and safe and clinically proven for you to reverse the inflammation and pain in arthritis and make a good comeback. Also ways to not lose any more cartilage. We want to protect the cartilage that's there. Some people get hyaluronic acid shots uh, to support with that. Do you, are you a believer in that? Well, I have seen the research on hyaluronic acid shots. And the positive thing about it is that hyaluronic acid shots actually improve the cartilage that you have and make it tougher and more resistant and less brittle to break away. So it actually helps with the progression. And I believe this is in contrast to all other medical approaches. However, I've also been told by people that the shots are very painful. And of course, the same effect can be gotten by using other means. We had one patient who we saw every month for two years. And when we first saw her, among other things, she kept saying, my knees, my knees hurt so much. She's that in a wheelchair. Was, that was mostly what she had to talk about. And then over the course of two years, every month or two, we would help her up level her eating habits from, well, she started off eating always at junk food restaurants, you know, the cheapest place Fast she food. could go. Fast food. <laughs> junk food. Same thing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Fast food restaurants. And over time, she started making food at home with her family. And well, after about six months, she didn't have the wheelchair. She had a walker. Uh, another six months, she had a cane. Another six months, I forget my cane all the time. I leave it everywhere. And she's talking about walking through the biggest mall in the world without her cane because her arthritis had reversed itself. Also, her migraine headaches went away. Well, that's a nice benefit. And her temper tantrums. Yes, yes. Yeah. So there are many things you can do for arthritis, certainly. Can you sum up everything we've talked about here today in 15 seconds? <laughs> sure. Sure. Eat a whole food, plant-based diet, avoid animal products of any kind, and be sure and supplement with vitamin B12, vitamin D, make sure your calcium levels are high enough, and have a happy, stressful, exercise-prone life. Every day is a gift. A life is a gift. If we appreciate it, and we appreciate that we are given, we have more respect for those around us, and perhaps for ourselves. In respecting ourselves, we have the courage to make simpler choices 
and to be satisfied with things that are less instant gratification, including cabbage or food that takes longer to prepare and isn't so instantly flavorful. In making cho choices that are life enhancing, whatever they be, we're living a richer life, we're a benefit to ourselves and those around us, and we're up-leveling our lives and those around us too. We have to love ourselves enough to make the changes. What's the one thing I need to do today? I got one. This is cute. You take, uh, you look a little tired, right? You've had a long day, sir. Um, you take ascorbic acid and baking soda. You know, emergency packets, that kind of a thing. You mix two parts ascorbic acid and one part baking soda, and it makes your own little vitamin C drink. And you drink it, and oh boy, it gets rid of a headache in 10 seconds. It's busy. It gives you your it's energy fun. all comfortable again. And uh, you can do it several times a day whenever you feel off balance. If you were going to do one thing, that's like a, a quick fix, cheap, easy, and uh, it totally works. My one thing would still be the whole food plant diet. Why do you feel it was important to come here and speak at the Real Truth About Health conference? I wanted people to hear about our clinical trial that Catherine and I both ran. And I wanted them to hear that it is, there is hope when you're having memory problems. There's hope when you're having mild cognitive impairment. There's even hope with mild Alzheimer's disease to try and turn this around or at least stop it so you don't get worse. And I wanted to expose people to the safe, natural, and clinically researched solutions so that they would feel confident that they could go ahead and try these and see if they could stop this process from getting worse. And sometimes people even get brighter. I think it's important that I came because I'll do anything I can to support this beautiful vision. It's like a miracle what's happening here. 10 days, all free, all the information. Whoa, no one does that. And on top of which it's all right on. It's beautiful, the teaching, the vision, and the enactment. We are thankful to all of you who put on so much work and so much expertise to make this happen. So anything I can do to support it, that's why I'm here. No, we I... are grateful for this conference and yes. we're grateful to be part of it and for the ability to help people from a distance now. I want to especially thank Stephen Shore, Brian Clemens, and Anna Maria Clemens for putting this together. It's just awesome. It's wonderful. It's the best, the best of the best.